Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Mondays. Rejoice. A full week of college football action is upon us. Games Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It is a college football corncopia of excellence. I cannot wait. Um, it's a long off season. I have got 15 gambling picks for you. I got them up early this week. I tweeted them out, uh, what, about three hours ago, maybe. Um, lots of picks. I'll go through them on Thursday at a minimum with Kelly Stewart. We're going to be doing the fade as we did last year, a college football and NFL football focus spectacular where we debate and discuss the picks that we will be making each week. Um, typically that will be on a Thursday, although my travel schedule, probably not going to shock you, going to be pretty crazy during the fall, uh, what with big noon activity, um, with all the obligations of Clay and Buck and Outkick in general. For instance, next week, I'm going to be in Florida, DC and LA, uh, all over the place for much of next week. So anyway, we will do weekly sports gambling shows. I will be doing weekly sports gambling picks for those of you who would rather read than, uh, than actually watch or listen to videos. We will be doing, uh, I'll be doing my usual starting 11 columns every Sunday or Monday, breaking down the weekend's activities that were. We're going to have a brand new 12 team poll uh, with a lot of different experts out there to break down everything. Uh, that has to go with the 12-team playoff, and uh, I can't wait. So uh, you guys know I love college football. It's my favorite time of the year right now when everybody is super ecstatic, super excited in the belief that their team is going to be the best possible version of themselves, particularly now. It's funny. I've owned OutKick or owned OutKick from 2011 to 2021, so the last three years Fox has had it. But the data always shows September and October are actually the best months for football fans, both college and pro. Why? Because hope springs eternal. Every year, it doesn't matter what it is, September and October, traffic is off the charts. Every September and October, every sports fan, football fan comes rolling in. They're like, this is our year. Everybody's overlooking us. Man, we've had a lot of gains in the offseason. This is going to be incredible, both college and pro. Then by the time Halloween gets here, a lot of people have come to the reality that their team is probably not as good as they hoped. The hope has faded. It is no longer eternal. November is a dark time in terms of competing for championships. But... This is why I've supported a playoff for some time in college football. I actually think that there will be far more people out there that are willing to support their favorite team because I think we're going to enter November. Like, we're going to get through uh, Halloween, and we're going to enter November, and there's still going to be 25 or 30 teams alive in college football, maybe more, depending on how the season breaks, where guys – and gals can sit around and be like, well, we can still maybe make the playoff, which is what the NFL does really well. The NFL sells hope. Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NHL, the reason why they keep expanding the playoff is the longer you can be convinced that your team might win a title, the more attention you pay. And college football has been awful for that because typically by the time you get to November, you're down to seven or eight teams often that really have a legitimate chance to win a championship. I think 25 or 30 are going to be alive. I'm excited about it. I was also excited to watch the game on Saturday between Georgia Tech and Florida State. Our prize picks pick hit 1-0 and on the season. Uh, we managed to get the dub. I went 3-0 and in different bets from the Georgia Tech and Florida State game. We got Georgia Tech plus the points, double-digit underdog wins outright. That was a breather, an easy one, although the first Florida State drive where they got a touchdown, what do you think happened? Your boy took some flack for being on Georgia Tech. Then all those Seminole fans vanished. It was 8-zip. 
Florida State looked like a juggernaut. Then Georgia Tech got their Irish sea legs underneath them and basically took control of the game. And Brent Key's team, this is their second full season. He came in as an interim in year one. Yesterday, last year was the first full year. Georgia Tech's really starting to make a difference here. Brent Key deserves a lot of attention and a lot of credit because they have decided we're going to build on the offensive and defensive lines. And you heard all offseason Florida State fans talk about how talented their defensive line was going to be. And then, wasn't a lot fancy, Georgia Tech went out and dominated them on the lines of scrimmage and made plays down the stretch, walk-off field goal. Congratulations, Georgia Tech. Biggest win for the Yellow Jackets in a very, very long time. I think it was their first top 10 win since they beat Florida State. Adam, correct me on this if I'm wrong. Since they beat Florida State on the kick return, uh, the uh, the blocked kick return, if I remember correctly, um, that uh, that was kind of a walk off, 22 to 16. Am I getting that one right? I think that was the last time Georgia Tech beat a top 10 opponent. So look, college football during the course of the season will make all of us look like imbeciles. But even if you are a dyed in the wool Florida State fan who is still in uh, despair over that performance. 12-team playoff means you still have a chance, okay? Now, the problem is, I told you, I don't believe by and large that quarterbacks are going to rise up from nothing and become successful, okay? DJU has all of the skill sets out there to be an incredibly elite quarterback, except he doesn't see the field well and he doesn't throw the ball beyond 10 yards very well either. Now, he had a couple of late fourth down conversions, to his credit, that led to a tie. But the reason I bet on Georgia Tech was, typically, a quarterback that has moved around a lot is not going to be an incredibly elite quarterback for his new team. Now, let me explain what I mean by a lot. Sometimes quarterbacks move and they can end up performing at a high level. But usually they only move once. If teams let a quarterback leave twice, the odds of that quarterback being really, really good are very low. And that was why I said, hey, I like the under in this game because I thought Georgia Tech would play a physical style, take the proverbial air out of the game, and also... I don't think that DJ has the ability to take the the top off a defense. There were open receivers downfield. He didn't see them. He looked the exact same that he did for Clemson and for Oregon State. There are sometimes quarterbacks who transfer, and at their second major school, they end up having everything come together. Hendon Hooker at the University of Tennessee. Cam Newton, although that was a little bit different because he got kicked out of Florida, he had to go to Blinn Community College, if I remember correctly, and then he ends up at Auburn. Joe Burrow, Ohio State to LSU, right? There are quarterbacks you can point to that leave one location and end up successful at their second location. There's almost no quarterbacks who go to three different schools. Why does that happen? What, What lesson are you learning there? What typically happens is maybe one time you've got really a talented guy that you don't happen to beat out and you end up going on the road. For instance, let's use Joe Burrow as an example. Uh, Joe Burrow couldn't beat out Dwayne Haskins. Well, Dwayne Haskins was a first-round draft pick. That was an incredibly talented quarterback room, and Dwayne Haskins ended up as the guy And Dwayne Haskins is a really good college football player. So the fact that he goes to LSU doesn't necessarily mean that Joe Burrow wasn't great. He clearly was. I think he had maybe the greatest quarterback season, certainly as a pocket passer, that any college quarterback has ever had. One of my favorite games that I've ever been to, 2019 uh, LSU against Alabama in Bryant-Denny. Tua against Burrow. 
offensive talent everywhere on the field in that game, I felt privileged to be there and see college football being played at that high of a level on both sides. One of the greatest quarterback duels I have ever seen. I felt fortunate to be there in person. I think it was 2019. Um, Reason why I bring that up, sometimes you don't beat out the one guy. So if Clemson couldn't find an answer for DJ and he had gone to Oregon State and he had balled out incredibly and then he stayed there, I would say, okay, you know, this is a Bo Nix-like situation. Guys at a Southern school, doesn't happen for whatever reason. He transfers, light bulb comes on, system fits him perfectly, and it all comes together. The third move is a huge red flag. Third move is, oh, record scratch. It's unlikely that two different major programs have been unable to get a guy to play at an incredibly high level, and suddenly the light bulb comes on at the third major program. Honestly, that was the logic under which I took Georgia Tech. And so... If I'm a Florida State fan looking around right now, I tweeted it. DJ is not good enough for you to be able to contend for a championship. Now, doesn't mean you might not be able to make the playoff because the ACC is wide open. SMU didn't look very good. I think Clemson's going to go down to uh, to Georgia this weekend. I think they're going to get whipped. NC State, I think, will give Tennessee a good game. I think there are a bunch of teams that you can point to in the ACC and say, hey, if things go well, that could be a 9-3 and three or 10-2 and two regular season team that gets into the championship. Maybe Notre Dame, although I think they're going to go on the road personally and lose uh, against, uh, against Texas A&M. I know they play still a lot of ACC games, whatever. And by the way, my blood bank guarantee, let me go ahead and say it, I love A&M to win and cover the two and a half. That is my blood bank guarantee in College Station in Aggieland this weekend. I'm going to make you guys so much money, you're going to be out drinking like crazy at Dixie Chicken. You're going to be buying drinks all over Aggieland saying this one's on Clay Travis. Thank the Lord we listened to him. That's an early uh, preview of what's going to happen there. The problem is you're not going to be able to win the college national championship, even with a bye, if you win the ACC with DJ at quarterback. Not good enough. So Clemson is not a national title contender. Top 10 preseason team, double-digit favorite. They travel to Ireland, they lose. Let me say this too. I love the idea of the Irish game. I don't know who in Ireland tourism was like, hey, you know what we need to do? We should bring over Notre Dame. We should start doing a yearly kickoff game in Ireland. But everybody in England, you got served on this one. I love week zero. I love having the kickoff over there. I would be super interested in making a trip. Remember, I took my family to England to go watch the Tennessee Titans play in London at Wembley Field, Wembley Stadium. It was amazing. Such a huge, awesome experience. I would imagine that even FSU fans coming off of the loss and even Georgia Tech fans, with the, if they had lost, would still have said, man, it was a lot of fun to go to Ireland, pound a bunch of Guinness beers, and have an incredible time. I thought college game day, fabulous scene. Nick Saban did very well. Um, I think he's going to be an excellent addition to the overall repertoire of that show. Now, I'm on big noon. I think we're going to be better. Uh, But I still loved all of the uh, pageantry, the pomp, the circumstance surrounding week zero and the kickoff. Congratulations to Georgia Tech. FSU doesn't have a quarterback, not ready for prime time in terms of challenging. Tough to go with last year, losing Jordan Travis to that injury, getting left out of the playoff. You have an entire offseason. You get demolished. A lot of your guys decide to leave, don't play against Georgia. And you're so excited about the start of the season. And then you come out and you just get beat down physically by the more dominant in the trenches team. Congratulations, Georgia Tech. Uh, Brent Key is starting to turn that program. So that is my take on that game, which I set and watched the entirety of. Uh, Okay, a couple of other uh, different stories that are out there. Um, I wanted to hit this. Do you guys see... 
Oh, hold on. Adam's uh, fact-checking me. Yeah, Georgia Tech beat FSU 22-16. to The walk-off kick six was from October of 2015. Am I correct? That was the last time that Georgia Tech beat a top-10 opponent. I remember that game. I think I said it was 2016. It was actually 2015, just FYI. Um, I believe that was the last time Georgia Tech beat a top-10 opponent. Um, Brittany Mahomes. I don't know how many of you saw this, but you're starting to see some athletes and former athletes be comfortable coming out in favor of Trump. Uh, And by the way, you should be able to come out in favor of Trump or against him. But you had Max Crosby, defensive end, wonder uh, child, like absolutely dominant. Gardner Minshew, who has been announced as the Vegas Raiders starter, both posing with Trump at a rally he was doing in Las Vegas. You also had Sean Merriman, a friend of mine, uh, former incredible defensive talent for the Chargers, come out and say, hey, uh, I'm going to vote for Trump. Now you've had Steph Curry and Steve Kerr come out at the DNC and say that they're going to vote for Kamala, as is their right. Uh, Steph Curry recorded a message. Steve Kerr spoke there. But what I want to do is really contrast Brittany Mahomes, Brittany Mahomes is the wife of Pat Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes. Um, some of you recognize her. Some of you don't. She obviously has been in the uh, suite a lot with Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift dating Travis Kelsey. Primary receiving uh, target of Patrick Mahomes is Travis Kelsey. And so there have been a bunch of viral moments with Brittany Mahomes and with uh, uh, Taylor Swift. So on Instagram, I don't know who does this. But it seems like there are a lot of stories where people go on Instagram and check to see what other people have liked. I don't even know how this works. I don't know how to check and see what someone liked on Instagram. I'm not very savvy on Instagram. We post a lot of videos there, but I very rarely post on Instagram. Most of the videos that we post are clips from this show that go up on Instagram that are posted by OutKick for me, and then I'll you know go on and make sure they get well distributed, all those things. I understand the audience is huge on Instagram. I'm just not a guy who's ever thought, hey, people really need to see pictures of me. I'll go on there every now and then. Like we had a 20th wedding anniversary. I'll sometimes post a, uh, a a kid picture or whatever. Most of the stuff from me on Instagram is just one of these OutKick videos that's shared by the OutKick social team. Reason why I bring that up. I don't even know how to check and see what people like on Instagram. I'm not savvy enough. She evidently liked a post from Donald Trump and people went bonkers, came after her with a fury. And I just want to point this out. Brittany Mahomes got more criticized that I saw for liking a post supporting Trump on Instagram than Steph Curry and Steve Kerr did combined to actually speak at the Democrat National Committee and endorse Kamala Harris. That is, in the sports universe, it was more acceptable to actually appear at the Democrat National Convention and speak in person like Steve Kerr did, or record a video message like Steph Curry did, than to merely like a Donald Trump post on Instagram, which is what Brittany Mahomes did. Now, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but so far, there has not been any walk back from Brittany Mahomes of her like of a Donald Trump post on Instagram. In fact, If you'll look up what the exact phrase she used to call out people who were criticizing her, I love this. I never really had an opinion of Brittany Mahomes at all, but what I hate is when somebody does something and then they immediately run from it and try to pretend that they didn't do what they actually did. Instead, Brittany Mahomes basically called out the expectation is, based on the timing, all of the people that came after her for liking a Trump comment and didn't say a single negative word. Now, this is somewhat interesting because Patrick Mahomes has said he won't be endorsing anyone, I believe, in the 2024 election. Now, if you really wanted to have the world come undone, if Patrick Mahomes came out and endorsed Donald Trump, it would be incredible to see. Same thing with Joe Burrow, I mean, just in terms of the reaction. I mean, I would support it. 
but just in terms of the reaction that would ensue, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, any of the top quarterbacks in the NFL, if they just came out and said, yeah, I'm all in on the Trump train, the sports media would lose its mind. All of the same people that have told you for years, athletes should speak out more. Athletes should use their platform to advocate for political opinions. All of those people would flip in an instant and decide that it was totally unacceptable that this happened. But what I love about Brittany Mahomes is she said, I'm not going to apologize at all for anything. And it makes me wonder if Patrick Mahomes is actually a closet Trump guy. This wouldn't be a huge surprise. Um, So I'm going to talk about this in a sec. 18 to 29-year-old men, and I believe Patrick Mahomes is still in his 20s, are actually supporting Trump. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic. We've got now a gender divide that may decide the election. And I don't know how many of you saw, but in the last hour or so, Tulsi Gabbard has joined RFK Jr. in endorsing Donald Trump. Tulsi Gabbard ran for president of the United States as a Democrat in 2020, is credited with a super viral moment where she went after Kamala Harris and essentially Kamala Harris's campaign never recovered. Now, I think Tulsi and RFK Jr. are doing what I do, which is stand on principle over politics. I care more about the First Amendment and open, uninhibited, robust debate than I do any other issue. To me, if you can't have unrestricted, completely wide open debate on all issues, then you can't get to the best result for the country. When the government tries to engage in censorship, when the media advocates for people not to be platformed and for their opinions not to be shared, I think we end up in a worse place, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent. So Trump is, for me, by far the best option when it comes to supporting free speech. In fact, I don't think it's remotely close. Now, some of you out there are going to respond and say, well, Republicans are the ones that want to censor books and not allow... No, they're not. This is one where I think the media has done a really bad job, and I actually think Republicans have done a poor job of responding on this. All Republicans are talking about when they talk about books in school libraries is the age-appropriateness of a book. I just went and saw Deadpool versus Wolverine. I really enjoyed it. As soon as the movie was over, my wife and I, had a discussion about whether our fourth grader should be able to go see Deadpool versus Wolverine. He loves superhero movies. He loves wrestling. He likes sports, but he loves Marvel movies, likes all the superhero movies, has seen basically all of them. But he has never seen the Deadpool movies because the language and the violence is a bit much and they're rated R, and we haven't let him see them, and he's been begging us to be able to see those movies. May not surprise you, but I said right after we finished Deadpool versus Wolverine, hey, you know what? I think we should let our fourth grader watch the Deadpool movies. And my wife said, are you kidding me? There is sexually explicit humor. There is crazy amounts of violence, and it is inappropriate for a fourth grader to be able to see these movies. My wife gets to break the tie. I would let him watch them. My argument would be that the sex-related humor is way over his head. He's not going to understand any of it. And the violence and the language, so the violence is so cartoonish that it's clearly not real, right? It's a superhero movie. And the language, yes, I get it. There's lots of bad language, but I'm not a, oh my goodness, somebody used a curse word. Uh, style person look and the reality is if you're around my age we started going to r-rated movies especially when they were action movies or violent based movies really early also i saw a lot of those horror movies back in the 80s the nightmare on elm streets the jasons all those things this is not a debate about censorship the books are out there this is a debate much like the movies that I'm talking about, about whether or not it's age-appropriate to allow someone to see 
a movie or read a book based on what they are ready to see. And I think people have done a really poor job. Like, even at the DNC, all these guys came out and said, we're, you know, not trying to censor books. Actually, you are. There are a lot of censorship, for instance, of To Kill a Mockingbird because the N-word is in it. There are a lot of different outlets uh, where people say, hey, because of the content, we're not going to allow somebody to read this because we're afraid somebody might get triggered. I actually think that is a real debate that you can have. But the First Amendment is widely embraced now by people uh, supporting Trump. RFK Jr., a lot of you are RFK Jr. people. A lot of you are Tulsi people. So I think this is a big deal. Now, I also want to mention this. I read over the weekend, this was on the front page. Uh, By the way, credit to Brittany Mahomes. Adam has looked it up. No walk back that I'm seeing. She actually doubled down after the reaction. I absolutely love it. Um, Okay, so um, I wanted to make sure that I hit this. I was reading the Sunday New York Times over the weekend, and uh, there was a, a, well, the gender gap. I mentioned that I wanted to discuss the gender gap. Women right now are voting for Kamala Harris, according to the New York Times, by plus 38 men is around plus 12 so we've got one of the biggest gender gaps ever and it's typically happening for 18 to 29 year olds and if you are intrigued by this gender gap we had a huge discussion about it on clay and buck today i would encourage you to go download the podcast and make sure you don't miss a moment of it um the biggest gender gap among all ages is actually occurring among 18 to 29-year-olds. Trump is actually winning 18 to 29-year-old men. Uh, And Trump is winning men of all ages. And Kamala is winning women of all ages. And so the real question here is, who's going to do a better job of picking off the opposite sex? Is it Kamala getting men to vote for her or Trump getting women to vote for him? And that is a big part of, I believe, what's going on with Tulsi Gabbard, but also the primary reason that Kamala Harris picked Tim Walls as uh, her running mate. Now, um, I wanted to tell you guys about something else that I read in the New York Times over the weekend. And that was a analysis of Vanderbilt University, my alma mater of the law school, welcoming back students. And I just went on the Faulkner Focus earlier today on Fox News. By the way, I'll be on with Jesse Waters at 8.30 Eastern tonight. But Daniel Deermeyer, who is Vanderbilt University's chancellor, told new students at Vanderbilt, the university, I'm reading from the New York Times, this is on the front page, the university would not divest from Israel. It would not banish provocative speakers. It would not issue statements in support or condemnation of Israeli or Palestinian causes. And he also said Vanderbilt would not tolerate threats, harassment, or protest disrupting the learning environment at the university. Now, I am a graduate of Vanderbilt, actually a double graduate. I've got two graduate degrees. My wife has got two graduate degrees from Vanderbilt. My sister went to Vanderbilt undergrad and got a master's and is a teacher right now at Vanderbilt University. And my brother-in-law went to Vanderbilt for med school. So I'm a big fan of Vanderbilt University. But man, I love this response. And I think it is reflective of how well SEC schools in general have handled campus protest. Look, I talked about the First Amendment and how much I support it. I'm a First Amendment absolutist. Some of you became aware of me because I said I only support two things completely, the First Amendment and boobs on CNN with Brooke Baldwin, which threw her head for a loop and has gotten me banned from CNN. Why do I bring that up? You don't have the right to put up tents and take over university quads to advocate for the beliefs that you might have. You simply don't get that right. What we need to have is content-neutral policies so that we can embrace any perspective on campus that you can argue for anything that you would like to argue for But just make sure that whether you're arguing in favor of Palestine or in favor of Israel, uh, pro-choice or 
uh, or in favor of uh, uh, less restrictive or, or more restrictive abortion-related issue, whatever you want to argue for or against on campus, just make sure the content-neutral policies apply. That is, you are treated the same no matter what your perspective is. And I think the SEC schools have done fabulous handling that and taking care of what is an otherwise really, really difficult proposition to analyze. Now, I love all of you. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP, I will be on Jesse Waters tonight. Uh, and then we will be talking college football a lot all week long. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Congratulations to Georgia Tech. Congratulations to all of you who took our prize picks pick last week. We got the win. We'll see if we can keep the roll running. 15 gambling picks up on OutKick right now. We will discuss all of those and more in the fade on Thursday. A lot to discuss. Great moves for Trump to get Tulsi Gabbard and RFK Jr. on his team. I'll discuss all that and more all week long on Clay and Buck, and also all week long on OutKick. As always, DBAP unless you need to SBAP. This has been OutKick, the show.